really wants to do what they like it is important to keep evaluating yourself every single day into what you are doing you will get an answer whereas in a startup it's all about how can i make quick decisions a lot of times you might be wrong a lot of times you might be right and in startup you can always roll back and you can always can again start so quick commerce definitely i mean it has been a disruptive model in the industry right it has changed customers expectation altogether right Hey there. Welcome to Marketing Mavericks with Indie Folio. Today we have Anuj Shrivastava with us, who's the Senior Director of Marketing at DealShare. Anuj's experience spans over a decade, where he's worked with some incredible companies like Dabur and Colgate and FMCG. Then he shifted to tech and fintech with Paytm and previously Amazon. and he spent the last year with dealshare and i'm very excited to unpack this journey of his and discuss a lot things around q commerce e-commerce and more marketing aspects hey anuj thanks for your time and welcome to the podcast thank you so much kevin for having me uh, you know i i am very happy that uh, you took out some time on a sunday there was just a long weekend before this so i'm sure there's a lot of work <laughs> so I, i'm really appreciative of the one hour you gave me today keeping that in mind i'll like to get you know started right away Uh, I know you've done a MBA in marketing before that. You've done engineering. So when is it that you decided that you want to build a career in marketing? So while I was doing my B Tech, was somewhere at that time it had struck me probably I'm not cut out for a a technical role, so to say, right? So right from the second year of my engineering, I started getting economic times, <laughs> right? So so right from the second year, it was pretty clear to me that probably technical area is not where my forte lies and where my interest lies. So I started preparing more for the business world, so to say. Right from the second year of my engineering, right at the time of placement, also I mean the companies where I got placed as a part of my final placement. So Deloitte is where I joined. So they did not give any technical round. You know, it was a business case study which they gave, right? So so that is how I managed to get into Deloitte. So I was doing B Tech in ICT, uh, but uh, somewhere in the midway itself, I knew that probably that's not what I want to do. uh and uh, i have been participating in a lot of events in my college also in a lot of uh say not technical case study competition business competitions also and uh, this is the feedback which i got from my friends also ki boss i think you are better meant for a marketing kind of a role a business kind of a role rather than get into and do some engineer or bit become a database administrator <laughs> so so it, it that dawned upon me quite early in my engineering days so it was a pretty easy decision for me to make you know a lot of people maybe in a similar boat where uh, they are maybe studying one thing but have realized it's not their cup of tea right. but they are very scared to you know make that jump because they're like i've invested money into this course of shifted cities i've made promises to people blah blah right. how did you deal with such uh, such a scenario and what would you have to say for people who are kind of confused and they want to take a jump so there might be n number of people around you who would say this area is hot this field is hot this particular role is hot go for it right so i've also heard it when i started my uh, higher education journey right because at that time because it was the trend everybody was doing btech so i said okay let me also go ahead and join that so called rat race right but it's very important for somebody to understand uh, it themselves right because majority of the people would be saying what is in the trend that time right what everybody is doing but ultimately it's you yourself who know within you okay this is what i like doing for example in my case so when i joined engineering course it's not that i was not interested right uh, somewhere i was not clear till that time when i was getting into engineering and this is what i want to do but once i got into it mm. i have spent some one year one and a half year then i realized that probably this is not exactly what i want to do i was getting good marks i was getting good grades i was in the top i think 5% but marks are not everything right they do not reflect on what you want truly from within right so i think if somebody really wants to do what they like it is important to keep evaluating yourself every single day into what you are doing you will get an answer so you don't need to listen to your friend you don't need to listen to your family or what others are saying because most of them will be having a perception opinion based on what's going on around them at that time what everybody is talking about right same thing happened with me my parents also said hey everybody is doing engineering so so they never said you need to do it they said are you interested i said at that time we did not have so many avenues of getting information and doing comparisons i'm talking about say early 2000s right 2002 3 types right so at that time we were not lucky enough to have a uh, podcast and you know so many sites where we can do the comparison of roles uh, and different fields where one can pursue their career so i said okay why not i gave uh, my engineering entrance examination got good marks i got into the institute 
so i think to answer your question in a very succinct and brief manner you should keep evaluating every single day of what you are doing you get an answer yourself yeah? you will not have to really uh, waiting for some mentor or some expert to be coming in and telling you no no this is not what you, you should be doing your skill set li- lies there your interest lies here so i think your heart will tell your conscience will tell you no no this is what i am not enjoying so no point doing it now situation might be such that you might have to finish something before getting on to what you really like some people are bored enough to take a call no 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 this is it right so it's a cold turkey situation mm-hmm. no no i need to jump off right now <laughs> i don't want to waste even uh, those another 6 months or one year time so so that's an individual's call based on the situation that person is in right so i'm not saying but anuj can you tell me like you know what what made you feel okay you are enjoying this because you mentioned you were getting good marks yeah. you know you were doing well from a, a objective point of view i have observed that a lot of people sometimes just look at that as their success metric right. and forget in the process what they love so was there any movement or is what do you what do you ask yourself when you do that self analysis sure. so a lot of my batch mates i mean who were not so much into studies so they would come and they'll say hey anush can you just explain us this concept in like one hour so that we can at least pass the exam right so while i was doing that to them i realized it's, it's those small things which i'm enjoying more right rather than actually getting good marks and you know scoring high okay these five folks are coming in before every exam they're saying hey anush yaar zyada mat batana just in one hour tell Okay, <laughs> that much so that we can clear the exam. So by doing that, I realize that uh, when I'm talking to people, I'm able to understand their purpose. I'm able to understand what are their likings, dislikings, and people uh, were also quite open in reaching out to me and asking for things that they want. So somewhere I, I felt felt probably my area of interest lies more into something which involves real people on a day to day basis, right? where we can understand what they want we can provide what they want in as simple manner as possible as in right so so those small small things which were happening right <laughs> during those days that kind of further cemented reinforced that thought in my mind that okay this is what i want to do this is what i don't want superb superb you know you you've spent uh, several years in uh, various companies uh, you were in fmcg then uh, you were uh, in fintech you are in you know e-commerce q-commerce or hyper local commerce yeah. right now um a lot of marketers when they are starting out um, they've been given advice that you should uh, double down on one industry you will become a category king or queen and uh, people will rely on you and maybe this is the road to being a ceo in one of those category companies right. eventually and the other end there are people who say that no you know i i i love the first principles of marketing and i want to leverage them in various industries and become a more rounded marketer right. Uh, of course, you've you've chosen the latter. Was that a conscious decision? What would you have to say to people who are deciding should I double down or should I experiment throughout my career? Uh, so I'll start from my MBA days, right? So after B Tech, I worked for a year or so uh, in a technical role with Deloitte, right? Then I moved on to do my MBA from uh, SP Jain Mumbai, right? So even during the MBA course, also uh, you would know in MBA colleges you have these uh, uh, summers placements. So in our case, it used to be uh, autumns project, right? So you have to go in the industry work for two months, right? And then after that, there used to be a final placement, right? So that process where companies would be coming to your campus, right? They will be interviewing you even for the summers or autumns in our case, and even for the final placement. I would call myself lucky that I had to sit into at least eight to ten of those companies, right, <laughs> in both the process before I finally made into one of them. So I did my internship with Philips, and I ended up getting an offer from Dover. But while I was going through that process, so. Uh, i sat with companies from diverse industries right so for example someone like a uh, say a nestle someone like a uh, uh, say a pwc someone like a uh, philips someone like a uh, novartis right so there were companies from various backgrounds so i had to obviously study about those companies when i am going and sitting in the interview so while i was reading about either each of those companies that further intrigued me so much that okay there is so much in each industry which is different although marketing's fundament marketing's fundamentals remain same right but the moment you read more and more about different industry you feel wow there is so much to do in each of those industry right so some of the people might say hey you had to sit in 8 to 10 <laughs> of those companies to get into it but i i i look at it as a really fortunate thing that happened with me right where i got to know about different industry different companies and nuances so from that point itself i was pretty clear in my head that i don't want to stick with one company one industry because there is so much that each industry has to offer right so uh, 
so so nothing against those people who spend like their entire life in a, in one company or one industry but i felt especially in india scenario india was at such a stage that there were new business models emerging new companies coming up new startups coming in each industry so sticking to one company one industry was kind of i felt it might not do justice from a learning perspective somebody wants to really learn mm. across right horizontally so that was the thought we started right from the mba days but one more thing which was continuous in my head everybody used to say it's fmcg where you should start your career because fmcg as an industry teaches you those nuances about marketing so what you will learn in fmcg industry about marketing they can sell uh, air also to customer right you will not be able to learn it in any other industry so that's what everybody used to say let's see what is coming up as a big thing as a new thing right so i was clear i am not going to stick with one company one industry but this belief was also there this thing was also clear i started with fmcg and let's see uh, what next after that and after how much time yeah fantastic fantastic and you know coming on the starting piece um today you'll see a lot of job offers from startups yeah. um and uh, there are a lot of job offers of course and placements done with big companies too and you work with like indian public companies multi multinationals you work with like established unicorns yeah. and even right now a hyper growth unicorn so uh, what do you think at the earliest stages of my career i should do should i go with an established company or should i hop on to a startup one uh, obviously your own uh, risk appetite your own hunger for learning right that is one factor and second factor which not too many people talk about is uh, what the personal space in which you are operating right you are an individual but there are a lot of strings attached to it right you might have taken a loan right uh, you might have a family for whom you are going to be the primary earner so to say right so i think both the factors will play a very very important role now if the latter carries a higher weightage then it's better for you to work in a established firm for say 4 5 years get at least some safety if you have a loan you have to pay your emi again it's better to work in an established firm for some 5 6 years right uh, build some capital base but if that is not the constraint for you then i would say in current scenario it's better to start with startups because the 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 pace of learning uh, the speed at which it moves uh, a person will be able to learn much more and achieve much more right in a startup environment versus an established firm see in an established firm you always work at uh, not making a wrong decision so your objective is i should make the right decision i should not make the wrong decision in established firm right whereas in a startup it's all about how can i make quick decisions a lot of times you might be wrong a lot of time you might be right and in startup you can always roll back right and you can always then again start right so i think uh, the answer to your question would be those two factors very very important uh, for an individual and whichever carries a more weightage uh, So I think from a learning point of view, startup definitely offers far more opportunities, and uh, but one needs to look at their own personal space also, their situation, their context before. Because nowadays there's so much, so much talk about startups, and I've seen people who have a lot of constraints at their family end, but just because again this is the talking point of the town, so so they go with the flow. So one needs to again evaluate where do they stand, where do they, uh, what what's their position actually. Fair enough. I want to now ask you about. Uh... Uh, you know where where you've been spending i think the last a year i guess uh, which is deal share right. um you know uh, what, can you tell us a little bit about uh, where deal share deal share lies in this entire space of uh, so many hyper local players today right which in my opinion has been one of the fastest and the most exciting growing sectors in the indian startup uh, ecosystem right. so can you tell me a little bit about uh, what probably prompted you uh, to join this industry right. uh, and uh, where you folks are positioned so i have close to 15 years of experience right so i spent some 5 6 years in uh, traditional fmcg companies right uh, like you mentioned so i worked with dabur for about 3 and a half years i worked with colgate family for about 2 years so that was about 5 and a half years in fmcg industry with uh, companies which are known for their systems and processes right uh, then i moved to amazon uh, again pretty sorted in terms of systems and process although speed wise it was far fast moving organization as compared to the previous one where i have worked then from then there i moved on to paytm again paytm was into multiple things fintech it had e-commerce arm also it was into lending mutual fund etc then i worked with a pure play startup right which was a small organization some 80 90 people it was into martech saas space so after having gone through so much experience uh, i realized 
fmcg e-commerce and something which is at an intersection of fmcg and e-commerce right that that is quite an interesting space and if you look at the models right models have been continuously evolving in this space right for example in india fmcg market would be grocery market would be somewhere around 600 650 to 700 billion dollars right now right still mm-hmm. primarily it's uh your kirana stores which are contributing maximum in that sale about 80 80 odd percent right then you had modern trade then you had e-commerce right now in e-commerce currently it's contributing about 10 11 odd percent of the total fmcg sale but the, the interesting part in e-commerce is um, so if you go back and see in last six seven years there have been different models every company has been experimenting with right first amazon flipkart came into the marketplace model then in grocery this place realized probably marketplace model doesn't work we need to have an inventory model right now then in inventory model somebody realized okay probably next day delivery or two days later delivery might not work let's give slotted delivery on the same day then somebody realized even slotted delivery on the same day after eight hours will not be enough let's start offering in 10 minutes 15 minutes right so in terms of model the the way it's evolving it's really fast and even today nobody can say with surety which model is going to work in in fmcg online commerce space right although some of the companies are doing pretty well now there were companies who were doing pretty well a couple of years back right so model continues to evolve and the very fact that still only 10 percent of the sale in groceries coming from online so potential is huge and that is why every player is trying to get into this space right uh, so what amazon and flipkart started then you had the geomarts of the world then you had uh, 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 big baskets of the world coming in into regular e-commerce, right? And then came the quick commerce, so Zepto, Blinkit, and Swig Instamart. But even today, nobody can say that they have cracked uh, grocery e-commerce space perfectly, right? Nobody can say that. Uh, so deal share when uh, so when I was evaluating my next option in January, uh, so deal share they started as a social commerce firm, right? So social commerce, as as you would know. Uh, it works on the network model, right? You acquire customers and then those customers will help you acquire new customers, right? Social commerce was pretty big and it worked pretty well. But then somewhere the company realized last year, uh, probably we need to pivot because social commerce from the unit economics point of view might not work that well. Uh, we mm-hmm. were into B2B, B2C both. So we said, okay, B2B again, from a margin point of view, it's a train. So uh, let's focus on B2C. Uh, so there were a lot of those pivots which happened last year. So in January, when I joined the firm, uh, it was into a, a, a juncture where a lot of pivots were happening. So Dealshare was trying to move away from a social commerce to an online commerce player. It was trying to become an omni-channel player, right? Not a regular e-commerce only. When I say omni-channel, so we have got our physical stores also, right? Obviously, we have our uh, online commerce, online app through which customers can order. And then we are also doing uh, this uh, quick commerce, so to say from our stores itself, right? In, in 20 to 30 minutes delivery. So I think DealShare is the only company right now in, in India, which is operating in all these three models. We have an online commerce, we have our offline stores, and we are also into so-called quick commerce, right? Otherwise, all the other companies which you look at right now, either they are having offline stores, they are having their online commerce, either they're into quick commerce only, right? Uh, any example, if you see, but I think uh, we are the ones who, although at a very small scale right now, uh, on the offline model and uh, the quick commerce that I'm talking about, it's still at a small scale, but we have all the three models which are existing. So, so, so this was this looked pretty interesting to me uh, when I was uh, kind of deciding on my next option. So in January, uh, this looked very promising. And uh, as I said, grocery and online commerce, right? It itself has a huge potential. Penetration is still quite less. So, so, so all these things actually kind of uh, made me quite interested in this. So I thought. Challenges would be there, but it will be a good turnaround story if you are able to crack it. Fantastic. Uh, I wanted to ask you, you know, what's your thought on generally Q-commerce and how it's growing? Uh, there's been a lot of conversations around how it could potentially replace e-commerce. Uh, we are seeing people order headphones, do passport printing and, you know, whatever general printing and God knows what not right. uh, on Q-commerce now. I wonder uh, if you have a certain opinion on that and if DealShare is looking to capitalize into those trends as well. Yeah. So quick commerce, definitely, I mean, it has been a disruptive model in the industry, right? It has changed customers' expectation altogether, right? But one thing is uh, probably quick commerce is all those people uh, 
I would say who are money rich, time poor, yeah, to put it that way. Now, some of the people carry this perception, okay, metro tier one cities, most of the people are very busy, right? So they will latch on to this quick comma since they have money, they don't have time. But that doesn't apply to each and every person living in a metro city or a tier one city, right? Uh, if you look at a couple of research reports also, um, there are close to 70% people even in metro and tier one cities who are spending more than 50% of the monthly budgets on groceries. So that, mm. so their income levels are somewhere hovering around that. So those people are value seekers, right? Uh, they are not the ones who are looking for a 10 minute delivery or a 15 minute delivery. Now, obviously this model is great. Nobody would have ever thought that in 10 minutes you can get the stuff delivered to your home step or right? even these companies, they would have not thought that they can, they will have such a breakneck growth, right? Hyper, hyper local growth. But ultimately, uh, there are two things, uh, as a business, one needs to think, right? Uh, how do you make it profitable, right? Uh, from a unit economics point of view and, uh, till what point this growth is going to stay and when is it that you need to uh, probably bring in some new element now for this quick commerce companies as a model they are selling groceries in 10 minutes awesome they're operating via dark stores very good but the moment you start looking at unit economics right the moment that is where a lot of cash burn is happening right now right that is why they decided okay let's get into these other categories say toys electronics etc right Fine. Uh, even for those categories, there would be initial traction, but ultimately if you have to build a robust model where profitability is also coming and growth is also coming, then I would say somewhere slight shift might be required in my opinion, because see right now in dark stores, uh, these are small stores, right? Where you're keeping all those, uh, say 5,000 SKUs, which are being sold on the platform. Now, tomorrow you cannot afford to keep a Harpic at the same place where you are keeping an Ashirwada, right? You cannot afford to keep a boat earphone at the same place where you are keeping probably uh, uh, batteries, right? So the moment you get into the diversified categories, the supply chain that also needs to be transformed accordingly, right? As consumers, we just see, okay, this is what is available on the platform. It is getting delivered in 10 minutes. But the back end, there are a lot of uh, uh, hygiene element that needs to be looked at, a lot of operational elements that needs to be looked at, and ultimately, obviously, the unit economics needs to be looked at, right? So I would say 10, 10 minute or this 15 minute delivery is awesome. But the moment these companies start thinking about profitability, start getting into diverse categories, these operational and supply chain challenges would have to be addressed rather perfectly. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, it, it, it might even backfire. Right? So that's how I'm looking at it. Model wise, it's brilliant, it's disruptive. I don't think it's happening anywhere, anywhere else in the, in the world. So, uh, and it has Great. spoiled consumers in a way. It has changed the shopping, the consumption habits also of consumers, right? Uh, right. I love used to do plan, plan groceries and here I'm talking about those customers who are, uh, money rich and time poor, right? We, we would be doing planned grocery shopping, right? Tomato, potato, whatever, every three days we'll buy right? Now, yeah, we know if our cook is coming in, okay. Uh, now it's not there in the house. We will order, right? So consumption habits have changed, but for this business to become feasible, I think those are elements will have to be looked at, you know, the moment they start getting into diversified categories. I think, you know, one major advantage Q-commerce has over traditional e-commerce is, as you mentioned, the frequency of the number of times I open the app right. because in a week I open these Q-commerce so much more because I'm habituated doing so because of groceries or daily needs being solved. And tomorrow, if I see a plug from you guys saying that, Hey, by the way, I also sell this now or also sell that now because I am money rich and time poor, I then don't want to wait for anything. Right. You know, we were discussing recently between a few friends and we saw PS5 uh, being sold right. uh, and it was sold out <laughs> for that matter. Uh, maybe they were doing some testing. I don't know, but uh, I, I, I see that, you know, as a, as a very big advantage, which companies like you can leverage, which is attention is much more higher right. there. Uh, but of course, I think it's a supply chain nightmare and whoever cracks that I think has a pretty good growth ahead right, right. because for us, you know uh, yeah because for us we are actually uh, positioning ourselves as a as a mass player right so being a mass player we have to offer a value proposition which connects with majority of the customers right in in that geography in that segment so obviously we don't want to get into that space what we tell to people is okay we'll give you 10% cheaper right we might not deliver in 10 minutes but we'll give you 10% cheaper now, it might get delivered in mm -hmm. say 1 hour Right now we are doing a model, uh, a pilot where we are delivering in 20 minutes also, but 
ultimately our positioning is very simple we'll give you 10% cheaper than everyone else right uh we might not deliver in 10 minutes we might deliver in 1 hour we might deliver in 3 hours right so if you are a value seeker value conscious customer then teacher is for you if you are somebody who is like uh, money rich time for as we have been saying right then, then you can uh, hop on to a quick commerce platform so uh, so that positioning is very clear for us the value proposition that we are giving is we will be cheaper right in terms of prices so you will get a value uh, when you are buying from dd shop so you know uh, that's a great point you know i feel that's also a core differentiator where um, <clears throat> there are a lot of low, lower and middle income groups which you are targeting right. um you keep on mentioning price right so we all know they are price sensitive uh, but when you make your moat pricing it becomes pretty hard to you know sustain that because anybody else can come tomorrow and cut the price right. um uh, so when dealing with such a tg what are the usual marketing bets you take which generally you know solve for this particular problem right, right. sure uh, see in india i would say people are price sensitive but more than price sensitive i think people are uh, the customers are value conscious right so when i say value conscious now even if you look at our behavior also right in our behavior also if uh, we are able to save something right uh, we'll be going on to that platform so in in grocery as a segment as a category uh you would see loyalty uh being very i would say fragile right now uh quite possible you are buying your entire monthly grocery the planned grocery at the beginning of the month from x player but whatever you require uh during the course of the month which are urgent right you might be ordering from a quick, uh, quick commerce platform right so in grocery right on no no player can go on and say okay these customers are buying only from me right they are my exclusive customers in grocery as a as a category right uh so so that's the beauty uh because in india customers are value seekers they they are price sensitive also but most of them are value seekers irrespective of which class do they belong to middle class upper middle mm-hmm. class lower middle class right uh so having said that at dealshare we try to offer a lot of propositions so first of all our prices even on branded products you would see they are either lowest or they are second lowest right uh right so so that's the promise we give to customer that even those customers who are very brand loyal right or in certain categories people do tend to have brand loyalty if you are fond of certain brand of tea you will continue to buy that only if you are used to certain brand of toothpaste you will continue to use that however you might be open to experiment with a say floor cleaner brand right you might be open to experiment with uh say dry fruits right because in dry fruits you you don't have that connotation of branded player as such right so there are certain categories where brand loyalty is higher there are certain categories where customer is open to experimentation right so so what we have done is uh, a on all these categories where brand plays very important where customers are more brand sensitive right brand loyal there we try to offer them the best deal right in terms of prices then there are certain categories uh, where we have tie up strategic tie up with a lot of regional players local players right and we do strategic sourcing so we have started with a proposition of 99 rupees a lot of items under 99 rupees right so mm. customers can even get uh uh said detergent at 99 rupees and that to 3 kgs 4 kgs right customers can uh get a, a lot of home and kitchen item at 99 rupees at tawa for example right they can even get tea so we have got the entire range of tea options available there are 99 rupees uh, per kg tea option 99 rupees per kg namkeen option And it's not that they are inferior in quality in any way it's just that we have tied up with a local player right and that local manufacturer is the same manufacturer who is manufacturing for a lot of big brands right okay it's just that we are uh, taking that local brand we are using that private label and we are selling on the platform at that price point the moment the marketing effort goes from a brand then obviously price premium goes up right so quality wise is the same right but just that we are selling it under private label or under that regional brand we are able to uh, uh, offer that price point right so so we have a lot of strategic tie ups with these regional and local players into multiple categories tea namkeen detergent etc and 99 is one proposition that we operate in right apart from that we also have something called as say opp opening price point or entry price point where we say in this category these are the lowest price which are available in the market no other player will be offering this price point right 
So something as simple as say in detergents, the moment we say 99 rupees, I'll give you four kg detergent, right? So it's almost 25 rupees kg. So that's our OPP. No other player will be offering that. So, uh, so in our case, it's a play of brands. It's a play of these uh, regional slash local strategic sourcing, right? It's a play of OPPs, right? Or opening price point. And the ultimate objective is how can we give that value which my customer is looking for? It because it's a diverse uh, segment of customers that we are catering to. Right? Somebody who wants brands right. at a at best possible price, we have that. Somebody who wants who is okay and who wants to experiment with these regional products, these local products, we have something for them as well. So that's how we try to uh, kind of package the value for each segment of customers. Got it. You know, you you mentioned the ninety nine rupees. a uh, bit where uh, there's also a hardin loot campaign which uh, you know i came across and um, we are also entering into the festive part of the year very soon i was always wondering you know do customers today face some discount fatigue right you know how they say if everything is bold nothing is bold right. so when you have a campaign where there's an offer every day how do you make sure that you are still able to leverage it as an exclusive deal have urgency and have people actually transact mm. in those time periods sure. so this uh, uh, the hardin loot campaign so when we thought about it the idea was very simple we don't want our customers to think that okay deal share is a platform where only in first 3 days or first 7 days of the month there will be some good offers right we don't want our customers to think that only when there is a festive occasion there will be some good deals for them So our idea was very simple. We want to be known as uh, everyday deals available player, right? Just like we say everyday low prices. So we want to say everyday some amazing deals would be there on this platform, right? So that's how Hardin Loot, right? And Loot as a concept also we thought of because uh, a lot of people, a lot of customer tends to get this feeling that we got cheated. We went there and we got looted. We got cheated, right? So we said now let's do the role reversal, right? Now it's time for customers to do the loot, right? Up customer loot guy rather right. than getting cheated, getting looted, right? So that's how we thought. Okay, let's own this loot as a property, and tell this to a customer that you don't have to wait for special days, you don't have to wait for special occasions, special events. Uh, because grocery is something you do every day, right? You you don't just do it on first of the month. You just you don't just do it on some uh sale event happening. You do it every day. So there should be something for the customer every day. So that's how we thought of this mm-hmm. Hardin Loot as a campaign. and uh, actually in terms of execution also so every day we have something or the other on certain product categories that customer gets on the platform which will be better than any other platform any other player right so, uh, so that's how we uh, came up with that and uh, in, in fact i don't know whether you got a chance to look at one interesting campaign which we did as a part of it where we recreated that three idiots scene of uh, uh raju rastogi's house right uh, where all the three friends were sitting and they were uh, they came to raju rastogi's house to have food so we recreated that entire scene and customers loved it and they, they connected very well to it and uh, we got some 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 very positive results as a part of the campaign incredible i i, I tuned into a few i remember one where they were i think doing yoga i think to 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 uncles yeah, yeah. uh, in the park right. uh, but i will still see the three idiots one uh, i'll 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 definitely tune yeah, in sure. coming to the marketing you know bit specifically since you are dealing with this specific value conscious tg and you are doubling down on that as a positioning going to tier 2 eventually you'll be going to you know maybe more uh, marginalized uh, or or smaller areas uh, what's the marketing landscape there right uh, are you doing mainline are you doing films are you doing performance campaigns is it product marketing if you could just kind of unpack that for us sure. so still we call ourselves a digital first form right because still most of our business customers revenue comes through our online model although we do have physical stores also but right now uh, we are just starting with a few cities few stores now gradually we'll be expanding now since we are a digital first player so obviously uh, digital channels become our first choice right and <clears throat> in digital channels since you have got this luxury of uh, precise targeting at pin code level targeting right you can uh actually reach out to the most relevant audience and for you the most relevant audience uh would be somebody who's uh, already searching for grocery deals somebody who is already buying grocery from some of the other platforms right so digital definitely becomes our first uh 
media channel platform so to say right and most of our marketing budgets uh, we park on digital now apart from digital on the branding side on atl then yeah we do a little bit on radio we do a little bit on tv so we don't do tv series but we do a little bit of tv on say a news channels for example right mm-hmm. uh, we do print right uh, but in terms of uh, m- maximum spends from our marketing uh, mostly it is on digital now on digital again uh, it's it's a call that we have to take between branding and performance right so again right now we are uh, kind of keeping 60 40 as ratio between performance and branding right obviously if you are uh, able to spend mo- if, even if you are if you are able to get good results on branding it ultimately has a rub off effect on your performance also right your cost of acquisition goes down uh, your retention percentages improves for customers right so in terms of channel so we do atl we do digital we do a lot of btl also very hyper local targeted activations right uh so something like if there's an area where we see there's more potential yeah. so in those two pin codes we will be doing some hyper local market activation for demand generation so it's a mix of atl btl digital where uh, maximum goes into digital uh i would say a moderate amount goes into atl from a branding perspective and for quick demand generation instant demand generation we do a very pocket based uh, btl activations also market mm-hmm. activations got it got it understood understood and do you invest into influencer marketing yeah yeah we do we do so uh, so you yeah. know I, i from from what i observe it's more towards the micro nano folks versus let's say celebrity and established players right. um, usually what i see is a lot of brands for better reach end up investing into a few folks which give them that maximum burst right, right? so where how does your strategy fit into your overall plan right. so we do a lot of uh, influencer marketing as you rightly said uh, mostly it's around uh, nano and micro influencers and the reason is pretty simple i believe uh, see grocery as a category uh, there needs to be that credibility with the person right and the moment you start going to macro mega influencers or uh, tomorrow if a celebrity comes in say if xyz say akshay kumar comes in and he says hey i buy my grocery from <laughs> deal share i don't know how many people are going to relate to it right versus uh somebody having say 50000 followers in that specific region in that specific city right uh, he says okay i keep buying my grocery regularly from here and there are some amazing deals and these products specially you must check out so there is a greater believability credibility because grocery as a category is not like you are buying a washing machine or say a refrigerator once in 7 years once in 10 years or a car right so you need to have that connect very very strong connect and credibility and some of we feel that these micro influencers are having far tighter relationship with their followers as compared to those large influencers those celebrities mm-hmm. right that's the whole reason why we prefer a micro influencer strategy uh, for each region where we are operating compared to going after a, a really you know mega influencer or bigger ones understood fair enough so it essentially comes down to i think is having more engagement and you must be trying to kind of reach the active users uh, compared to you know the bigger Correct. ones I also want you to touch upon a little bit about the uh, omni-channel part, right? So, if a digital first company is opening a store, uh, what does that do to the marketing team, right? Like, do you folks? How do you folks go about doing that kind of a strategy? Because initially, it is all trackable. It's pan India. It's tar- targeted. Right. Now that you have a store, does it become more localized? Yeah. So then it becomes very very localized. For example, so if you're opening a store, then your hook might be. say i am giving milk half liter at 1 rupee right i am giving probably free half kg tomato right if you are opening a store you can't do that in, in a regular e-commerce scenario where you are delivering the next day or even after uh, at right. the end of the day right in offline space uh, it becomes far more localized far more targeted and the the consumer behavior is also very different for example if somebody is going to pick their kids from the school you know on their way back they'll just park the scooter and near the store they just walk in they might not buy the entire basket say they would not have 20 item that they buying but, but probably what was whatever was the requirement on that day probably floor cleaner or probably even if kid requested for a, a chocolate they would just park the scooter and come right so so it's very very localized you need to understand their uh, consumption behavior the hooks are very different in an offline store versus an online store right in online i can uh, pretty forward say you buy for 1000 rupees and i'll give you 1 liter oil free or i'll give you probably half 
half kg of almond curry, something like that, right? Here it has to be very, very, very nuanced. Okay. Uh, when I'm opening a new store, I would say I'll give you half liter milk for first 20 days at one rupee. So as to make sure they are coming every day, right? I, I would say, okay, now I have also included fresh fruits and vegetable range in my store, right? Because those are the uh, products which attracts, which uh, uh, brings footfall into your store, right? They might not be the products in an online scenario, which will be driving footfall onto your online store, right? So, so that's one. Secondly, still a lot of people come to offline store from an experience point of view also, right? Uh, uh, in, in online, it's very transactional, right? Whatever you are seeing on the screen, uh, your span of attention, your time of engagement is very, very limited. Once you're walking into a store, uh, you can very well spend half an hour. You can very well spend even an hour, right? You're checking out new products, right? Yeah. And you can understand whether consumer is liking it or not liking it just by the facial expression of the consumer, right? So it's an interplay of all five senses while customer has walked into the store. In online, it I can only know about a customer's uh, experience via number of clicks, via the time he spent uh, in a session, right? Whether he bought, he added to cart. So those are very, very transactional metric that I can look at in an online space, right? In an offline scenario, my person who's there on the store, he can very well observe, okay, the person is smiling while shopping along with someone, right? That means he's liking something, right? Or he's spending some time in reading back of the pack, right? That means he is still uh, exploring whether he should buy this for the first time or not. Probably he has not even tried that particular category ever. So it's an interplay of five senses. So a lot of things become very, very clear uh, then and there, right? So, so it's far more personal, I would say, right? Although, so uh, in a way, it's, it's very contrary on digital. We said it's very personalized, right? We can send you personalized content, personalized communication uh, on the media channel that you love to consume. But the real personal touch comes in when you are there at the store, this attendant, he is actually observing all the five senses coming to play, right? And you can say, oh, right. mila kya jo rahe the. because the person is still looking from top rack to bottom, rack, looking right. for that product, right? So, so it's far more personal in that way, right? That there's a high touch involvement. So I think that's why the both online and offline works very, very differently from consumers expectation, their shopping behavior. Although there are a lot of insights, which one can take from both the channels, but I think the approach to both should be very, very different. Right. Uh, so, so, so that's how we operate. Very, very insightful. Uh, you know, I think, um, the, the, the difference in hooks the five senses and the whole customer journey is so different. Uh, I think it must be a really interesting time for a digital first company to, you know, start having uh, an offline store or a chain of offline right. stores. Um, I, I, I wanted to, uh, I wanted you to unpack offer creation a little bit uh, more for me, you know, uh, how does uh, like to what, what does, what, What's the exact involvement of a marketer when a company makes an offer, okay. right? You say you, you buy this, you get that this much is off. You spend so much, you unlock that such a complex exercise, considering it has inventory and supply chain into it, business and strategy into it, margins and finance and so many things come into right. it. How do you think, how, how do companies actually devise effective offers? So this would vary from organization to organization, depending on their objective, right? Uh, for example, if somebody is focusing on just driving top line right now and not focusing too much on bottom line. So their offer creation would be more oriented towards how can I grow my top line? So top line as in, so how can I increase the basket value, the cart value in each order, right? The average order value, right? So they would be coming up with say certain slabs that, okay, if you are buying for a thousand rupee, I'll give you something. Now what that something is going to be, that will depend on, we'll look at, okay, penetration of when, which item is more in my customer audience, right? Uh, and that particular item gets clubbed with which other item, whether it's a main basket, uh, uh, a basket item or is it a niche category item, right? So, so we actually start with what's the objective of that organization currently in terms of whether they want to drive the top line, they want, they're focusing more on bottom line, or it has to be a good balance of the both, right? Then from there it starts, okay, if it's top line oriented, uh, objective, right. Then we would be focusing more on AOV average order value. How do I increase it? Then I will increase the slab. If currently my customer's average order value is say 
for example suppose 800 rupees now how can i take it to 1000 so those customers who are buying say between uh, 750 to 850 i want them to upgrade to 1000 so i will be introducing a slab mm-hmm. at 1000 rupees that if you buy for 1000 you will get say 1 kg sugar a sugar is something which gets bought every month in in the basket of each of these customer right so that is a very good value proposition for a customer now uh if my focus is both top line as well as bottom line right then i would like to uh obviously increase the aov the average order value but at the same time i don't want to have items like say uh the staples item oil uh say ata mm-hmm. etc which are low margin item right so i would rather rather like to play on slightly higher margin item say a dry fruit for example right maybe i would like to include personal care items also say a do which carries a good margin right that uh, so if it's a play between both top line and bottom line then accordingly i would be looking at okay these are the customers who had good uh value but they did not buy say personal care item right then i will introduce an offer for those uh, people okay now if you buy this much worth and you have got these two items of personal care also then you get to uh, receive this as a benefit right so so it ultimately depends on what as an organ what as a marketing team or a business team are your objectives for both top line and bottom line and then we look at the penetration of each product categories penetration of each product within those product categories right then we do slabbing of customers also that how many of my customers are falling in which slab say between 300 to 500 say 600 to 800 right what is their contribution in my top line what is their contribution in my bottom line right now obviously if my objective is more around top line then i would be focusing on say these two slabs which are contributing maximum to my top line how do i make them increase their basket value further right if my objective is say i want to improve my profitability then within each slab then further we will drill down at a customer level okay these are the customers who are giving me say less than 5% margin i don't need to spend i don't need to do any marketing for these customer why should i waste time? these are my valuable customers these are my gold one gold two let me uh, uh deploy my marketing resources for these customers which are giving me better margin so then we'll look at all these nuances also right uh not just for offer creation but also from a marketing uh standpoint that which channel we want to tap through which channel we can tap which particular customer segment in a better way right uh, so so Uh, for channel also we keep looking at roas which channel is giving me better roas from a performance marketing perspective and on the app also the customer who is coming uh, so something as simple as if a customer is spending more than 19 minutes on my app uh, they end up purchasing right so how do i make sure up i can make a person spend at least 19 minutes on my app so what kind of engagement hooks can i bring on my platform hmm. so yeah so so it's an interplay of lot of things which goes in but ultimately it has to drive those business objectives top line or bottom line right Um, um, yeah, so so super. I think uh, what a fantastic framework for anybody who's trying to create an offer. You know, get an objective, understand top line, bottom line, and accordingly increase your average order or your margins. So thanks, thanks for articulating that so beautifully. Um, I, I I'll I'll jump now to the last two questions. You know, which I had for you. Um, we spoke a lot about uh, your 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 campaigns and you know your marketing strategies. Um. I also want to understand your creative production stack. Uh, today, you know, you see companies having an agency on record. You see companies having no agency on record, but just engaging with them on project to project basis. Right. You see some companies even doing in house. Right. So, how do you do this? Is this a is it a mix of everything? If you could unpack that. Sure. So, in our case, also it's a mix of uh, uh, all these options. So, we have got an in house design team also. Uh, but this in house team primarily they works on say some short format videos that we have to do some uh daily creatives that needs to be churned out right then we work with different agency partners so we have got a digital marketing agency who looks after our social media marketing who looks after our performance marketing we have a different agency who works on our uh, shoots say for different video campaigns that we go on and do right for uh, media planning uh right now we manage it ourselves only right so so there are different agencies but for media uh, uh so it, it's on and off basically for for media planning and buying generally sometimes we do engage with some agency otherwise we do it in house for media planning and buy now coming on the creative side of things for the bau things we have got an in house design team 
for our social media marketing for our performance marketing we have an agency and for uh, main months main video campaign so we uh, get it done through another agency who is our video agency basically so wherever we see uh, they are understanding our dna they are understanding our requirement right uh, so, so so we try to take help from the agency partners also uh, so yeah it's a mix it's a mix for all got it so i think all all everything for speed and efficiency which is your daily jobs uh, is in house but all special projects or special mandates um, you end up outsourcing it to i guess uh, experts yes. uh, that's how you yes. operate um i you know since you've been probably working with so many agencies throughout your career i'd love to ask you you know what separates a good agency from a great agency as per you so one thing which uh, would definitely separate an agency from a good agency from a great agency is agency needs to understand their client's dna and when i say client's dna uh now since i have worked with uh, mnc is global mnc large size firms i worked with startup so agency needs to understand so if you're working with deal share right so it's a very startup kind of a dna in which you operate so speed of execution becomes very very important right it's very different from when you are working with a large firm where you can take probably a week's time to work on the brief and come up with ideas and then in the next layer next step focus on execution right but here probably because once once a once a brief is given quite possible you might have to churn out the idea on the same day and execution might have to begin from next morning itself sometimes on the same day itself right so it's very important for an agency to understand the dna of the client uh as to uh what is their requirement with what speed they operates uh what what what's the value proposition that they want to communicate to the consumer so that consistency has to be there in the messaging that is going to the consumer so i think very very important to understand the dna of the client now a, an agency who is working with a large set of clients and who is taking 3 days 4 days time to come up with one idea so in 4 days <laughs> th- things can turn upside down right <laughs> in a, in an online uh, commerce situation so i think it is very important for them to first understand uh, the dna in terms of speed in terms of uh, uh, those core messaging who's the uh, core tg right uh, and uh, depending on the organization agency needs to pick it up as quickly as they can right they might not always have that much time right uh, so with large firms and agency can spend good one month time to understand who is your key customer they might even get a chance to go and visit a few customers they can prepare a plan in our case probably in two days time they'll have to just understand everything and and that that uh, speed of execution becomes very important so i think understanding dna of the client is very very critical for an agency uh, before they start working right right you know I, we 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 actually are a network of a lot of studio owners agency owners and consultants so i think this will be like golden advice for a lot of those folks so thanks for that um this this is promoted us to our last question for the pod yeah. um you know i i, I we, we we've spoken a lot about advice to younger folks and i wanted you to just kind of conclude in in a similar line where you know if let's say you were to go back in time and you saw yourself just entering the job market right. what would be your career advice uh, to yourself for any young 20 year olds today since so my advice would be uh, don't just wait for say your superior or your manager to give you task <laughs> and and then you start working on it i would say right now there are so many avenues to learn and so many avenues to apply that learning that uh, uh, any fresher anyone who's entering into the job market they can do probably 8 out of 10 things themselves without being dependent on what the mentor is asking what the manager is asking them to do right that is what we used to do we were waiting for you know the instruction or brief or requirement to come in but i think in today's time uh, 8 out of 10 things these uh, a person should try to pick on their own right because things are changing so fast there are so many avenues to learn so many avenues to even apply that learning i think one advice which i would give is don't wait for work to be given to you <laughs> just pick it up yourself and just start exploring uh, on your own i think that's what i can say i couldn't agree with you more you know i think uh, having started off my company about a decade ago when i was in my 12th a uh, lot of people asked me you know what was the logic behind that and it was exactly this where you know you really don't need to wait for life to come to you you can literally reflect what you want and you can just get at it and nobody will stop Absolutely. you you know so a lot of people spend too much time wanting that third party like like you said you know a mentor to come and change their right. life but that generally never happens exactly. 
so so thanks thanks for you know a fantastic time uh learned quite a few things uh today and i i hope you also had a good experience anush yeah yeah i had a awesome time really enjoyed chatting with you and like i was mentioning at the the beginning also offline that you guys are doing some terrific work and i'm really amazed by how quickly you you and your team are able to pick up insights from each industry from each client for each company uh for, for conducting these kind of interviews which will be uh, really helpful for a, for a larger lot so i think uh, great work happening best of luck in your journey and hopefully uh you will do even more wonders you are already doing wonders <laughs> so kudos to you that's that's so sweet of you thank you so much it was a pleasure and uh, for everybody who's tuned in so far if you would like another guest uh, to come in in our next episode please like share and subscribe we'll be releasing something very very soon